Hi, this video is um, meant to introduce you to uh, using Schrodinger's equation with the barrier potential. Um, essentially what I'm going to do is show you um, the setup of the problem and some of the issues that you encounter as you try to develop the solution to the problem. So, um, yeah, so the thing to take away is what, what does it look like to do this problem, right? What are some steps involved and decisions that you have to make? Um, maybe, and, and also, what does it even mean to have a solution to this problem? Okay, so the, the problem is essentially to use Schrodinger's equation with the barrier potential. So what I've drawn here is, this right here is the potential energy axis. It's the up-down axis, so it's got units of energy. And then the side-to-side -side axis is the space axis. And the barrier, or the potential function, is this red line. And you can see that the red line actually has a, a vertical piece right here where the potential rises, and this is at x equals to zero. And then at x equals to w, the potential sinks back down. And at, uh, for x between zero and w, where w labels the width of the barrier, which is a spatial distance, right? Um, in quantum mechanics, maybe this is like micrometers, nanometers, you could imagine picometers maybe. Um, but anyways, so I've got this energy height and spatial width, and this is the barrier. This barrier, quite honestly, is um, kind of unphysical. It, uh, physics doesn't often have, um, right, this is not even a function because it's multiply valued. Uh, in the previous video, I gave you a much more physical situation. Um, but you'll see that if you were to try to do uh, some of the steps that I'm outlining for solving this particular barrier problem with Schrodinger's equation, um, if you used the same steps for that more electrical looking scenario that I mentioned in, in, the, in the previous lecture video, um, you'd quickly get a really, really difficult math problem, and you would have to end up doing it on a, a computer. Um, okay, so, but this one, it turns out that you can do by hand. Um, so being able to do something by hand is uh, referred to as doing the problem analytically. So there is an analytical solution, and... Um, what we're going to have, like the sense in which we have an analytical solution, is in a sense, we, we're going to write down the wave functions. So the wave functions, you know, they're functions, maybe they're wavy. In, in this particular case, you're going to see that there's a part of the wave function that's going to be an exponential decay. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to actually write down the functional form. When you do things with a computer, that's called a um, computational solution or a numerical solution. Uh, and the, the thing that you get from your computer, the numerical answer, is not going to be a function, right? Um, it's going to be a picture of a function. It's going to draw you a picture of the wave function. Okay, but we're going to be able to get, right, the sense in which we are solving the problem is we are literally writing down the wave functions. Um, you'll see that actually we're going to stop short of writing down the wave functions completely. Um, in the previous video, I alluded to transmission fractions and reflection fractions. And this is actually where we're going to take our problem solution. We're going to say that we really want to know what's the fraction of particles that get to go to the other side of the barrier 
And what's the fraction of the particles that didn't get to go to the other side of the barrier? Rather, they reflected. And Schrodinger's equation, you can get transmission and reflection coefficients actually by thinking about the wave functions. Okay, so we have this unphysical barrier. It is piecewise defined. Um, the value of the potential is this constant value, u sub 0, for x being between 0 and w. And the potential takes the value 0 all other places on the x-axis. And you can see that's what this is, right? Because the potential energy is piecewise defined, that means that Schrodinger's equation is going to be solved in pieces. But you know that when you solve Schrodinger's equation in pieces, there are boundary condition stipulations. The wave function has to be continuous. The first derivative of the wave function has to be continuous, right? So um, the time independent Schrodinger equation is what we're going to solve. It's the one, so you've got this like, so this is the, I always refer to it as the kinetic energy term. This is the potential energy term, the thing that has the U of X. And this is the, the right hand side, it's the energy term. So the kinetic plus the potential is the energy. So this is the Schrodinger equation. Um, and we are looking for solutions of this problem for a potential energy function that looks like this. It's the barrier potential. Um, this barrier potential is simple. Um, it's a single, single sort of rectangle, <coughs> rectangle bump of a particular width w. The sides are not slanted, they're, they're vertical. And even more than that, the potential is the same value and the value is zero on both sides of the barrier. So it's kind of like the simplest thing we could study. Uh, the truth is, is you can come up with all kinds of reasons why maybe your potential barrier uh, for something that you would like to model, right? A physical situation that you're modeling. It may not be this symmetric, right? The potential on one side might be bigger or smaller than the potential on the other side. Um, the top of your potential barrier may not be flat. It could be slanted or round, or the whole thing could be round. In, in, the, um, in the previous video, I gave you a realistic situation where the potential barrier is actually just a, a curved lump, right? It'd be the Coulomb potential in that case. Um, okay, so we're going to solve this time-independent Schrodinger equation for this potential energy, which is piecewise defined here. And if you remember, we could consider the classical situation where you are guaranteed to transmit at 100% and reflect at 0% compared to the classical situation where the energy was colder than the top of the potential and in this case, you would say the transmission was going to be 0% classically, and the reflection was going to be 100% because you did not have enough energy to go up and over the barrier. But because we, so these are two very different scenarios. The particle does not have enough classical energy. The particle has more than enough classical energy. And we can check both. We can kind of mess with both. All right? But remember, these are the classical expectations, and the quantum mechanical results are going to be different from the classical expectations. All right. So another thing to remember is because, so this BC means because, because the potential is time independent, we can, first of all, only do the, the time independent Schrodinger equation to start with. And even more than that, we always know that the time dependent wave function comes from taking the time independent wave function answer and multiplying by this uh, sometimes called the time evolution factor.
the time evolution factor is e to the minus i omega t, where this omega is a frequency, it's an angular frequency, that's related to the energy of our particle. It's the energy that sits right here. It's the energy that we're talking about being above or below the barrier height. So it's that energy that sits with omega, right? Um, yeah, so this is the, so you, you can, so omega is E over Planck's constant, H bar. Okay, so once we get the time independent wave functions, we can always get the time dependent wave functions uh, just by multiplying by E to the minus I omega T. All right, so now's the hard part, or it's not actually the hard part. So up here, uh, I'm going to redraw this potential. I'm just going to sketch it. So the potential looks like this. This is x equals to w, x equals to 0. Here's the x-axis. This is the u-axis. And this value right here is called u sub 0. So the, here is my potential barrier. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to split this stuff up regionally. So I'll say that this is region 1, region 2, oops, and region 3. So region 3 is x bigger than w. Region 1 is x smaller than 0. And region 2 is the third part. All right? So... In, I'll, I'll take away the word region, in region 1, um, u equals to 0, right? So in region 1, u equals to 0, which means we get a Schrodinger equation that looks like this. So minus h bar squared over 2m, d squared by dx squared psi of x, but we have to be careful. This is psi in region 1, right? So Schrodinger's equation is this thing right here. The, the value of the potential energy in region 1 is 0. So there is no potential energy term, or the term has value 0. So this is just equal to the energy, which remember is not space dependent. It is, a, it is a value of energy. Um, you could refer to it as a constant, but the point is, is, it is not it is not a function of space, right? So let me carefully point this out. It is not a function of space. It's, so that means that it's not regional. There is no E sub 1, right? Because it's independent of region. It's independent of anything associated with position. So let me take it away. It's just a number, and it multiplies the same thing, psi sub 1 of x, right? So what you can do is you can say that the result of taking two space derivatives of the region 1 wave function is to get minus 2me over h bar squared to come down as a factor multiplying the wave function, right? I, all I did was I take 2m, put it up to the top against the e, divide the h-bar squared downstairs, and move the minus sign over. And it just looks like if you take a double derivative of the wave function psi 1 of x, you're going to get this prefactor, right? You, you get this prefactor multiplying the psi. So what this is indicating is psi 1 of x is sine or cosine. And in fact, actually, we can say, well, we don't know whether or not to decide it's a sine function or a cosine function. Um, so actually, you know what? I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to say it this way. So let me try this. So let's pick, I'm going to pick uh, some coefficients p. So I'm going to say it's p times the cosine of kx plus q 
times the sine of the same kx, where k is the square root of 2me over h bar squared, and k is a real number. So I'd like you to notice that k is real. What I've done is I've taken this minus sign and imagined it actually being outside. So let me let me take it away oops, from the inside. And I'll actually I'm gonna move the parenthesis too. I'm gonna put that minus sign on the outside. Okay? So this right here I'm imagining is k squared. Can you see I I just chose it to be symbolized by something called k, where k is quantum mechanical because it's got h bar in it. K has something to do with our particle of mass m that's subject to the barrier of potential, and k also has something to do with our particle's total energy, right, which is some number of joules or some number of electron volts. But the point is, is k is real, all right? So that means that the wave function in region one is a mixture of, so, of some mixture of cosine of kx, and sine of kx, okay? But I could also, the truth is, is I could also write this in terms of exponentials. Is that true? Well, actually, I'm, I'm gonna leave it like this. But anyways, um, psi in region one is a, a wave, right? Cosine of kx, sine of kx, it's a wave. So um, I'm some ways into the problem right now. I know that over here, uh, I'm going to just sort of sketch it qualitatively, but over here in region one, I've got some sort of like sine or cosine wave or combination of sine and cosine. When you add sine and cosine together, if they have the same wavelength, Right? Can you see they have the same coefficient on the x and the same coefficient on the x? This is the coefficient. They have the same wavelength. If you add sine and cosine together with the same wavelength, you just get another sort of sine or cosine looking wave depending on the mixture. And the mixture is dictated by these coefficients. These coefficients, we can't solve for them right now. But where we are going to be able to say something about the coefficients is when we impose the boundary conditions. Let me show you what I mean. So let's go and look at region two. So region two, right? In region one, u is equal to zero. In region two, though, uh, u equals u naught. It's it's uh, actually positive. It's bigger than zero. So let's uh, let's write down Schrodinger's equation. So Schrodinger's equation in region two. It's minus h bar squared over two m, taking two space derivatives of the wave function, which is only space dependent because we're working with a time independent Schrodinger equation. But this wave function is the wave function in region two, right? We're, we're doing this regionally. And then the potential this time is not zero, but it is a constant. So it's a constant times psi of x, but this is the region two wave function. And it's equal to e times the region two wave function. But very carefully, I'd like to point out this e right here, that was in region one is the same E as in region two. Remember that the energy is not regional. So this is common to all three regions. That's something that's very important. But the energy is the energy of the system, right? Um, and it's the energy of the system whether or not you're looking at the system in region one, two, or three. So this is the same value. This is different though, right? This was regional because the potential energy is a function of space and space is what's being described in the regions. 
Okay, so, um, but let's look at what we have. So can you see that this is, this is a constant? This is another constant. They have the same units, right? So I'm going to write this. I'm going to say that h bar squared, actually, um, yeah, whatever. So 2m, I have two space derivatives, right? I'm going to leave, yeah, let's, yeah, I'll leave the minus sign. Too many uh, algebra steps at the same time. So minus h bar squared over 2m, two space derivatives of the region 2 wave function, which is only a x dependence, right, is equal to, so I'm subtracting this potential energy term over behind the energy term. So you get E minus U sub zero. This is just some amount of energy multiplying the region two wave function. So this is where we're at in region two. We haven't even done region three, remember, but we're in region two. Um, so now what, what can we have? Well, actually, this is where, where it depends. So what if E is bigger than U, oops, U sub zero, and what if E is smaller than U sub zero, right? Remember that that was something that we could explore. If E is smaller than U sub zero, we get to play with tunneling. If E is bigger than U sub zero, we get to play with the fact that our waves can reflect from a barrier that classically could not reflect them before, right? So right here is where we, where we get to play with two different problems. The two different problems are, is the energy smaller than U sub zero, in which case we get the tunneling, or is the energy bigger than U sub zero, in which case we have the chance that our waves can reflect from a barrier that classically wasn't able to do so, right? So this, this was the other possible energy situation. And this is the junction where we get to choose, right? We get to choose because this is going to um, either E minus U naught is a positive number or E minus U naught is a negative number. So um, before I do this though, I'm going to, um, no, l let's go ahead and, yeah, let's do this. So let's multiply the h bar squared over 2m, let's put it over to the other side. So in this case here, um, E minus, well, actually, let's, let's see what we get. So got d squared psi 2, okay, and then I'm taking minus h bar squared over 2m and putting it on the other side. So if I do that, um, I'm going to act with the minus sign inside the parentheses. So let me get rid of these little spurious things. So you get u sub 0 minus e, right, because of that minus sign being multiplied by 2m over h bar squared, and this is all multiplying the region 2 wave function. So th what this is saying is, uh, actually, th this step right here is actually true for both. Um, so yeah, just because it's algebraically true. So, so this is what I have. Um, if E is smaller than U sub zero, then I know that this thing, so let's, let's circle, if it's red, this thing is positive, right? But if E is bigger than U sub zero, then u naught minus e is negative, right? So this square bracket is either positive or negative depending on which of these is the case, right? Um, let's study the 
tunneling situation first. Right? The tunneling situation is when we don't have enough energy classically to go across the barrier, right? Or go beyond the barrier. So the tunneling situation, which is the, oops, e less than u zero, um, we have the situation where this thing is positive. And so that means let's define, uh, so this is gonna be a little confusing. Actually, yeah, uh, it won't be confusing. Let's define something called beta, right? Where beta is 2m over h bar squared, um, u naught minus e, right? But it's the square root of it. And beta is real, right? So, psi 1, uh, uh, so, sorry, psi region 2, the, so in this case, right, there, um, there is no minus sign. You take two derivatives, you get two factors of beta, right? Beta is the square root, so two factors of beta is the square root is gone, right? So you get two factors of the square root of 2m over h bar squared u naught minus e multiplied by the same function. And the kind of function that does that for us looks like this. So I'm going to use the coefficient a on e to the beta x and the coefficient called b on e to the minus beta x, right? So this wave function right here shows exponential decay and also shows exponential growth. But we don't get to choose right now because, uh, quite honestly, Schrodinger's equation says that both are parts of the solution for psi sub 2. But right now, you can wonder about a boundary condition. One of the boundary conditions is simply continuity. That is, psi sub 1 at its right side boundary, which is x equals to 0, must equal to psi sub 2 at its left side boundary. So psi sub 1 and psi sub 2 at x equals to 0 is supposed to be equal. This is continuity. But there's also a continuity in the first derivative, right? So continuity in the first derivative means that the derivative of psi 1 of x evaluated at x equals to 0 has to be the derivative of the region 2 wave function evaluated at x equals to zero. They have to share the same slope at the boundary, right? That's what continuity in the first der derivative means. They share the same slope at the boundary. So these kinds of things are going to impose conditions on the coefficients, right? Um, so up here, we've got psi 1 of x in terms of a p and a q and a k. In boundary 2, we have a psi 2 of x in terms of a coefficient called a and a coefficient called b instead of p and q. And we have a different um, little uh, interesting other constant that was defined. It's beta instead of k. Continuity. Right, so I have a um, continuity condition can get rid of one of the uh, A, B, Q, or P, 
in a sense, or reduce the number of unknowns from four to three. And then the continuity in the first derivative is a further uh, diminishment in the unknown constants from three down to two, right? Okay, so, so far, this is what the wave function needs to look like in region one, actually regardless of whether or not the energy is bigger than or less than u sub zero. In region two, if we're in the tunneling situation where the energy is smaller than u sub zero, in the tunneling situation, beta is real and is the square root of this stuff here. And we have this exponential growth or exponential decay. Notice that these are not waves. So our wave function is not a wave, right? And then um, afterwards though, in region three, it's again where u sub zero is equal to zero. It actually plays out the same as region one. Everything's the same actually. So the wave function in region three is another, right? So we've used P and Q. Let's use R and S. It'll be an R times cosine, actually of the same K times X, uh, plus S times the sine of KX, right? That'll be the region three wave function. And then there are also boundary conditions at the boundary between two and three, right? Regions two and three. So between regions two and three, you're gonna say that the region two wave function evaluated on the right hand side, right? The boundary between region two and region three is at x equals to um, w. Unfortunately, that w looks so similar to that omega this and this are not the same. I, I only just realized how similar they look. Um, in fact, I'm gonna make the symbol obviously not the same as omega, so w. Omega is really round, w is not round, right? This is uh, two v's in a row. Uh, this is more of a um, shape change, a morph, Oops. from this capital symbol into this um, lowercase symbol. Uh, anyway, so W, that's a, I wish I didn't do that, but whatever. So the region two wave function at W has to equal the region, whoops. Um, the region three wave function at W and also the first derivative. So the first derivative of the region two wave function evaluated at X equals to W has to be the same as the derivative of the region three wave function evaluated at W. So remember that when you, when for the first derivatives, you take the derivative first and then you evaluate at W. Right, you take the derivative first and then evaluate at W afterwards. If you evaluate at W first, then that means you don't have any X's left and when you take the derivative with respect to X, it, it's zero because you've already chosen to not let X vary anymore. X has the value W. So you have to evaluate the derivative first. People often make that mistake. But anyways, these boundary conditions are further reductions in um, the uh, coefficients R and S, and also P and Q, and also A and B, right? So I've got tons of boundary conditions. Normalization would be a final boundary condition, in a sense, because it's meant to be probability, but the problem is, is actually this is not normalizable. And the reason is, is because 
we now can, for example, in the tunneling case, here is what the wave function looks like. And, it, and I'm just going to draw it not to scale. So what that means is I'm drawing it without being normalized. But um, let me draw the barrier in red. So this is the barrier, right? And then I'm going to draw the wave function in black. So the wave function is actually a wave. And I'm going to start at this boundary. It goes like this. So it's a mixture of sine and cosine. That's the region one wave function. Here is the other side of the barrier. And what's happening in between, remember there's continuity of of the wave function from one into two, but also the slopes match up, right? And you have an exponential decay. Like this. And then in region three, you get a continuation of this. Right, again, there's continuity of both the, the function between two and three and also the first derivative or the slope. So, um, so this means that the probability is greater than zero to tunnel because the wave function is also on the right-hand side. This is a mixture actually of particles coming in from the left and leaving, heading back out, uh, coming in from the left and going back out uh, from the right. So this has uh, got a combination of incoming and reflected waves. This is just the fact that um, the tunneling probability or the probability to end up on the other side is exponentially decaying so you can imagine if the barrier, if the width of the barrier was even wider, then we would have more decay uh, before we could have the wave on the other side. So, um, yeah. Another thing is, is, and this is actually kind of uh, difficult to imagine, but remember that u equals to zero on both sides of the barrier, and u equals to u naught in the middle. So here, we don't have a well-defined energy, actually, because we don't have, um, we kind of have like an imaginary component to the energy, or something that's very unphysical about asking what is going on with the particle in this classically forbidden region. But on the outsides of the barrier, the energy is actually really clear. If the particle shows up on the other side, then the only kind of energy it's got is kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is associated with um, momentum squared, which according to de Broglie is associated with a particular wavelength. And we can look at the wavelength here. And the energy on the left-hand side is actually the very same thing, because remember, the energy is independent of region. But the energy on the left-hand side is all kinetic energy, because on the left-hand side of the barrier, there is no potential energy there. So it's all kinetic, which means that they have the same kinetic energy on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, which means they have to have the same wavelength on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. But because the energy is not defined on the inside of the barrier, there is no such thing as a wavelength because there's no such thing as momentum. In the barrier, it's kind of like a, a weird question to ask. There's, it's a question that doesn't have a, an answer that's um, sort of interpretable classically. Okay. So in the next video, um, 
I'm going to describe uh, the results for, um, so that is what I'm going to describe are transmission and reflection coefficients. They're called transmission reflection coefficients. Um, yeah, and uh, have some example technologies. Because uh, this is a very real phenomenon. Quantum mechanics is making the right predictions. And because it makes the right predictions, you can make technologies from those predictions, right? Uh, quantum mechanics always works the same way. It makes predictions such that the predictions are always the prediction. And you can make dependable technologies based upon those predictive phenomena, right? Okay.